perfect blue is like some sort of anime Zapruder film. No matter how many times you watch it, you still get the sense that you're missing something. That the key to everything is just outside the edge of the frame. A faceless killer, a fractured psyche, a scene or event which the audience has no reason to doubt but is later revealed to be not all that it appears. Perfect Blue is a sort of Japanese twist on the Italian giallo film, with parallels to films like Opera, Deep Red, Don't Look Now, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, and The Red Queen kills seven times. As with those films, once you know the ending of Perfect Blue, all the pieces of its central mystery seem to fit together like a well-made puzzle box. What sets Perfect Blue apart, however, is that even once the pieces are all in place, there's the sense that maybe the movie is only telling you what you want to hear, that you're no closer to unraveling the film than you were at the beginning. When we're first introduced to our main character, Mima, it's during her final concert with pop idol trio, Cham. Mima's leaving the world of the pop idol behind in order to become an actress. Even before she makes the announcement, rumors swirl among her adoring fans. It's the early days of the internet, and what might be secret or private doesn't stay that way for long. An all-girl pop group, you would think the main audience would be other young women. But no, the audience at Cham's concert is made up entirely of men, many of them armed with cameras obsessively documenting each performance. Even if no one will admit it, the singing and dancing, that's all just pretense, a venue for cultivating a very specific image, and all for the benefit of these leering, voyeuristic men. A pop idol must be bubbly, sweet, pure. A pop idol must be available yet unattainable, provocative yet chaste, disciplined on the stage and yet carefree in her personality. Central to Perfect Blue's narrative is the idea of the Madonna Whore Complex. First coined by psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, this psychological complex is said to develop in men who see women as either saintly madonnas or debased prostitutes. Men desire a sexual partner who has been degraded, the whore, while being unable to desire the respected partner, the madonna. Where such men love, said Freud, they have no desire, and where they desire, they cannot love. As Mima drifts further and further away from her pop idol persona, she transforms in the minds of her audience from Madonna to whore, her young male fans functioning as a kind of Greek chorus as they scrutinize Mima's every step along the way. The Madonna whore complex then translates to a set of expectations women either place upon themselves or have impressed upon them by those around them. Mima wants to leave behind the image of the porcelain doll pop idol because that's not who she is, it's an impossible expectation. In trying to prove herself as an actress and shed her pop idol image, Mima agrees to first a rape scene on her television show Double Bind, and then a nude photo shoot for a photographer with a lecherous reputation. In trying to shed the expectations of the Madonna, she embraces the expectations of the whore, where sex is framed as maturity, as liberation. But then if Mima can't live up to the expectations of the bubbly porcelain doll pop idol, neither can she live up to the expectations of the sexually strident liberated actress, because it's filming the rape scene that finally sends Mima over the edge into madness. It's in large part the impossible task of trying to reconcile the Madonna with the whore that leads to her disassociating from reality. Of course, that's assuming this is really Mima we're watching as she starts losing her mind. More on that in a little bit. Meanwhile, shepherding Mima through her transformation from pop idol to up-and-coming actress are her managers Rumi and Tadakoro. Tadakoro is the one most adamant about Mima's transformation, while Rumi, a former idol herself, is more skeptical, is more on the side of Mima staying the course with Cham. Note the strange, wide-set eyes on Rumi. Your first thought is, okay, this is just some sort of stylistic choice, but by the end you realize that these wide, maybe even fish-like eyes are a definite signal that something isn't right. This handsome devil here, known only by his chatroom handle of Me Mania, also has those same eyes, although you can only ever see the one, a single voyeuristic eye like a camera lens. Me Mania is a sort of distillation of every pressure, every expectation, every invasion of privacy put upon Mima. He follows Mima everywhere she goes, or if he isn't, Mima is imagining he is. When we're first introduced to Mimania, he's working security at Mima's farewell concert, going above and beyond the call of duty to protect her honor from a group of rowdy teens. By the end of the movie, he's trying to rape and murder her. As Mima sheds her pop idol image, as she's transformed from Madonna to whore, Mimania goes through his own disassociation, his own break from reality. 
He's apparently put so much into this idea of who Mima is or should be that once she diverts from that and to such an extreme, his only recourse is to destroy the reality of Mima to protect his fantasy of her. It goes back to that quote from Freud, where men love, they have no desire, and where they desire, they cannot love. Another way in which Perfect Blue differs from the typical split personality psycho thriller is it toys with the idea of a kind of shared disassociation that Mima, Me Mania, and Rumi are each wrapped up in and reinforcing a mutual psychosis. To try and better understand how this might work, we have to take a look at the idea of Mima's room. When Mima first hears the words Mima's room out of a fan's mouth, and then again from a piece of fan mail, she of course takes it literally. Someone, somewhere, is watching her. Mima closes the curtains to her room, something which will come into play again later. Mima's room, she learns, is a website where fans gather to talk about the former pop idol turned actress. On this website, Mima then finds something claiming to be her diary. When Mima first reads the diary, she finds it funny. These are the early days of the internet, remember? But as she reads on, and as the diary begins to include more and more intimate details, along with what appears to be clandestinely taken photographs, then Mima begins to worry. The curtain to her bedroom window flutters as if her inner life were being peeled open. Because not only is the author of this diary, in posing as Mima, chronicling her private life, they're also ascribing motivation to everything she does. The milk, says the diary, just has to be cow brand milk. I have to allow myself at least this much luxury. Today I went shopping in Harajuku because I'm a sucker for sale items. The author of the diary is crafting their own idealized version of Mima, to the point where, as she begins to lose track of time, of reality, and her own sense of identity, she's shown relying on the diary to place her own whereabouts. Mima's room represents her inner life turned inside out, the place that should be her own private getaway turned into a public forum. Already, in the earliest days of the internet, Perfect Blue had anticipated the mental tortures of social media. The movie presents the notion of identity as a collaborative, if not quite consensual, process between the observer and the observed, each with the potential to bleed into the other and sometimes resulting in all-out war. This is how we arrive at the shared delusion between Mima, Rumi, and Me Mania, is in the struggle between the observer and the observed. If the observer can control that thing which has commanded so much of his attention, then he is master of not only it, but of himself. It's no coincidence that Mima's chosen fish as a pet, a chance to be the observer instead of the observed. But again, this is just one interpretation. This is assuming the movie is being straight with the audience, which it hasn't been for the entire runtime. And this isn't even getting to the murders yet. One by one, the men in Mima's orbit are dispatched. First the screenwriter who wrote her rape scene, then the photographer who took the nude pictures of her, then her stalker Mi Mania, then her producer Tadakoro. Each has their eyes stabbed out as if they've seen too much. The movie even goes so far as to show Mima killing the photographer, stabbing him in the eye, stabbing him in the groin. But then again, nothing is ever what it seems. Throughout the film, Satoshi Khan uses intercutting to not only throw the viewer off balance, but to communicate Mima's losing touch with reality. The past is intercut with the present. Reality is intercut with scenes from Mima's television show, with what seem to be dreams or hallucinations. The frequency of these cuts increases as the film goes on, heightening both Mima's and the audience's sense of instability. It helps form that central question, what exactly is or isn't real in Perfect Blue? When is the movie lying and when is it telling the truth? More importantly, does it matter? Is the truth even the point? When at the end of the film, Rumi is revealed, at least in one interpretation, to be the killer, imagining herself as the idealized pop idol version of Mima, it's also revealed she's created an almost complete replica of Mima's room in which to immerse herself. This presents the question, is it possible we've been in Rumi's copycat room before, only without us knowing it? Usually, I don't really go for movie conspiracy theories. For instance, the idea that you can tell who's really the alien at the end of the thing by a glint in the eye or something to do with a whiskey bottle. Shut up, no you can't. The point of the end of the thing is to go out on the same ambiguous paranoid note as the rest of the film. I don't believe in trying to pour over the incidental minutia of a film to try and force connections that aren't there. But in the case of Perfect Blue, I think the movie really does lend itself to that level of scrutiny. 
In the midst of all this intercutting between past and present, fiction and reality, is it possible that the film has also secretly been cutting between two different Mimas, between real Mima and Rumi Mima, long before the revelation of her psychosis? There are a few differences between Mima's room and the copycat. For one, there's the Cham poster on the wall, but the most obvious discrepancy is the view outside the window. This is why I think it's important that Mima closes the curtains towards the beginning of the film is to at key moments deny the viewer this distinguishing element. So, when might the audience have been fooled into thinking they're watching the real Mima when it was actually Rumi as Mima? I think the strongest example is in the much debated fish scene. The fish scene takes place just after Mima's simulated but seemingly no less traumatizing rape on the set of her television show Double Bind. On returning home, a seemingly unbothered Mima finds that all her fish have died, which then sparks a nervous breakdown where she trashes her room, only to come to and find no dead fish at all, but two live ones instead. But what if this scene isn't showing us Mima at all, but Rumi, or else is intercutting between the two? Mima trashes the entire room, but notice how she stops just short of the window curtain, which, if she tore it down, would reveal the view outside her window, the one thing that might challenge her delusion. The dead fish, I've heard it theorized that between the dead fish and the alive fish, we are actually cutting between Rumi and Mima, that Rumi had perhaps stolen most of Mima's fish and left behind the last two. What we're led to believe is that up until this point, Mima has been suppressing the trauma of filming the rape scene, that when she gets in the car with Tadakoro immediately after the shoot, tired but seemingly unaffected, and then afterward, when she gives a seemingly unaffected interview, we're led to believe that she is sort of compartmentalizing the experience. But what if she wasn't? What if Mima really is fine and it's only ever been Rumi who's been unable to reconcile the idol with the actress, the Madonna with the whore? Who knows what Rumi might have gone through when she was an idol herself. When Rumi breaks down in tears while watching Mima's rape scene, maybe she's weeping for herself more than Mima. Of course, that idea is punctured a bit when you take into account this other scene where Mima is visited in her room by her idol persona, only this time we do see the view outside her window and it does appear to be Mima's, or else there is no telltale yellow train marking it as Rumi's. It's also punctured by many other scenes that really do seem to be the real Mima breaking down. Then again, there's also the idea that maybe Rumi has nothing to do with it at all. What if it really was Mima doing all the killing? What if the final twist of Rumi being the murderer, the one with the split personality, is just a figment of Mima's imagination, a neat solution like what they might have come up with on Double Bind? What if it was Mima, Rumi, and Me Mania all doing the killing? What if it was none of them? What if this idealized version of Mima really did take on a life of its own? More than that, who wrote the diary? In the more overt interpretation, we can assume it was Rumi, but how do we know for sure? Who sent the letter bomb? Was that Rumi dancing up there on the stage, imagining herself as Mima? Is Mima coming upon the hammer instead of one of the screwdrivers, which would be closer to the MO of the killer? Is that meant to exonerate her for the murders? There are so many questions, so many different possible interpretations, that it could drive you crazy thinking about them all. But then that's the point. The point is not necessarily to come up with an answer, the point is how effectively the questions are asked. And this is not a casual or a wishy-washy sort of ambiguity either. What boggles the mind about Perfect Blue is how its ambiguity is as carefully constructed as its more orderly, giallo-inspired resolution. The movie somehow manages to weave together two completely separate realms of narrative logic, one based on the classical reasoning and deduction of the murder mystery, and one based on metaphor and a more subjective interpretation. The effect is that of the movie's own narrative being disassociated from itself. How the hell do you do that? How do you make a movie whose narrative voice is so completely in tune with its plot, its characters, and its themes, and involving such a complicated subject? It's as if the same madness that's infected Mima, Rumi, and Mimania, passed between them like a bug, like a computer virus, has reached out and infected the viewer, breaking the barrier between artist and audience, observer and observed, mimicking the same precarious identity-forming process that turns men into monsters and drives pop idols to kill.